press record. And you go right ahead, Deacon Stout, and take over. You got to unmute yourself, though, first. All right. You got me? Gotcha. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Glad to see you. Good to be seen, isn't it? All right. I'm going to be coming from 1 Corinthians 5, uh, verses 1 through 13. Okay. Thus begin the reading of God's holy and an earned word. It is reported commonly that there is a fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife, and ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that have so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covenants or extortioners or with idolaters. For then, for, for, for then must ye need go out of the world. But no, I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covenant or an idolater or a rallier or a drunkard or a extortioner with such an one not, I'm sorry, with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Thus ends the reading of God's holy and earned word. Okay, let's look to the Lord. Father God, I come to you first and foremost, just thanking you, Lord. I ask, Father God, that you would open the minds and hearts of each and every one of us tonight, that we may hear your word and understand your will, Lord. I ask, Father God, that you would give me the strength to be able to, to teach your word, Lord. Not my word, but your word, Lord, and you would have your way. So, Father God, we just give you all the honor and we give you all the glory and all these things we ask in your mighty, precious name, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Okay, if I had to put a name to this lesson, it would be church discipline. Okay, here we go. Church discipline has always been a source of discomfort among the saints. Because of our love for one another, we tend to confuse forgiveness with consequences. As Christians, we must forgive and try to restore the brethren. But if they refuse to admit their sins and ask for forgiveness and continue to be disobedient to God's word, then our hands are tied. In this scripture, Paul gives us insight into such matters. The church at Corinth was not only a divided church, but it was sin in the assembly. And sad to say, everybody knew about it. No church is perfect, but human imperfection must never be an excuse for sin. Just as parents must discipline their children in love, 
So local churches must exercise this discipline over the members of the assembly. Church discipline is not a group of pious policemen out to catch a criminal. Rather, it is a group of brokenhearted brothers and sisters seeking to restore an earring member of the family. Since some of the members at Corinth did not want to face the situation and change it, Paul presented to the church important consideration. Consider the church. What will this sin do to the church? Is certainly an important consideration. Christians are called to be saints, 1 Corinthians 1, 2. And this means holy living to the glory of God. If a Christian loves his church, he will not stand by and permit sin to weaken it and perhaps ruin its testimony. Let's stop there and examine what the scripture says about ruining testimony. Roman 2, 17 to 24 says it best. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in, 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 in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who have whore idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemy among the Gentiles because of you. This scripture lets us know how important our testimony is, and not just for our fellow saints, but more for the unbeliever. How can we bring souls to Christ with this kind of church testimony? So how should we respond? Paul gave three specific instructions for the church to follow. Mourn over the sin. This is the word used for mourning over the dead, which is perhaps the deepest and most painful kind of personal sorrow possible. Instead of mourning, the people of Corinth were puffed up. They were boasting of the fact that their church was so open-minded that even fornicators could be members in good standing. The sin in question was a form of incest. A professed Christian and a member of the church was living with his stepmother in a permanent alliance. Since Paul does not pass judgment on the woman, 1 Corinthians 5, 9 and 13, we assume that she was not a member of the assembly and probably not even a Christian. The kind of sin was condemned by the Old Testament law, Leviticus 18, 6 to 8, 20, 11, as well as by the law of the Gentiles nation. Paul shamed the church by saying even the unsaved Gentiles don't practice this kind of sin. While it is true the Christian life is a feast, 1 Corinthians 5, 8, there are times when it becomes a funeral. Whenever a Christian brother or sister sins, it is time for the family to mourn and to seek to help the fallen believer, Galatians 6, 1 and 2. The offending brother in Corinth was dead as far as things of the Lord were concerned. He was out of fellowship with the Lord and with those in the church who were living separated lives. Judge the sin. While Christians are not to judge one another's motives, Matthew 7, 1, 5, or ministries, 1 Corinthians 4, 5, we are certainly expected to be honest about each other's conduct. In ministry, we have never enjoyed having to initiate church discipline. But since it is commanded in the scriptures, we must obey God and set personal feelings aside. Look at what it says in Romans 16, 17, 19. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause division 
and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Paul describes here an official church meeting at which the offender was dealt with according to divine instruction. Public sin must be publicly judged and condemned. For our Lord's instructions about discipline, study Matthew 18, 15, and 20. The sin was not to be swept under the rug. For after all, it was known far and wide, even among the unsaved, who were outside the church. The church was to gather and expel the offender. Note the strong words that Paul used to instruct them, taken away from among them, 1 Corinthians 5, 2. Deliver such and one unto Satan, 1 Corinthians 5, 5. Purge out, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. And put away, 1 Corinthians 5, 13. Paul did not suggest they handle the offender gently. Of course, we assume that the first, that we, of course, we assume that first the spiritual leaders of the church sought to restore the man personally. Ezekiel 3, 16, 19, I believe says it best. At the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to a wicked person, you will surely die and you do not warn them or speak out to dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life, that wicked person will die for their sins and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person and they do not turn from their wickedness or from their evil ways, they will die for their sins, but you will have saved yourself. This was, this was to be done by the authority of Jesus Christ in his name and not simply on the authority of the local church. Church membership is a serious thing and must not be treated carelessly or lightly. What does it mean to be delivered, to, to, to deliver a Christian unto Satan? It does not mean to deprive him of salvation, since it is not the church that grants salvation to begin with. When a Christian is in fellowship with the Lord and with the local church, he enjoys a special protection from Satan. But when he is out of fellowship with with God, excommunicated from the local church. He is fair game for the enemy. God could permit Satan to attack the offender's body so that the sinning believer would repent and return to the Lord. Purge the sin. The image here is that of the Passover supper, Exodus 12. Jesus is the lamb of God who shed his blood to deliver us from sin, John 1, 29, 1 Peter 1, 18 to 25. The Jews in Egypt were delivered from death by the application of the blood of the lamb. Following the application of the blood, the Jewish families ate the Passover supper. One of the requirements was that no yeast be found anywhere in their dwelling. Even the bread at the feast was to be unleavened. Leaven is a picture of sin. It is small but powerful. It works secretly. It puffs up the dough. It spreads. The sinning church member in Corinthian was like a piece of yeast. He was defiling the entire loaf of bread, the congregation. It was like a cancer in the body that needed to be removed by drastic surgery. The church must purge itself of old leaven the things that belong to the old life 
before we trusted Christ. We must also get rid of malice and wickedness um, and replace them with sincerity and truth as a loaf of bread. 1 Corinthians 10, 17. The local church must be as pure as possible. However, the church must not judge and condemn those who are outside the faith. That judgment is further, is future, and God will take care of it. In 1 Corinthians 5, 9, 13, Paul emphasizes once again the importance of separation from the world. Christians are not to be isolated, but separated. We cannot avoid contact with sinners, but we can avoid contamination by sin. If a professed Christian is guilty of sins named here, the church must deal with him. Individual members are not to company with him. 1 Corinthians 5, 9. Get mixed up with, associate in, in, intimately. They are not to eat with him, which could refer to private hospitality or more likely the public observance of the Lord's Supper. See 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 34. Church discipline is not easy or popular, but it is important. If it's done properly, God can use it to convict and restore an earring believer. 2 Corinthians 2, 1, 11 indicates that this man did repent and was restored to the fellowship. There are always consequences to sin. And even though we must forgive the sinner, there are consequences for our actions. God forgives us of our sins and we should forgive one another, but God does not do away with consequences. Thank you. God bless you all. Amen. Thank you, Deacon Stout. Hallelujah. Good word, good teaching uh, from the doctrines that come from the Apostle Paul's letters, the early church, the first uh, century church uh, that, that Deacon Stout alluded to and, and quoted from several of the, of the letters that Paul wrote on these matters. Uh, amen. God bless you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Father, we thank you for the, the word that came out. We thank you for the teaching, Lord. Uh, praying, Lord, for the courage to live up to uh, what the word of God is telling us. For Lord, you didn't teach us these things um, just for word's sake, but you taught them to us, Lord, because it's for our good. It's what brings out the best. It's what helps us to live out the life that you have designed for us to live, that there's more joy, there's more happiness, there's more peace, there's more unity in the body of Christ when we follow your word. So Lord, we ask today that each of us will search our souls and do the best that we can uh, to live up, Lord, to walk worthy of the calling that you have given to us as the church. Bless the word of, the word of God as it's been come to us tonight. Seal it in our hearts, Lord, that we may remember it. And bless, Lord, the body of believers who has been partaking of it tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Deacon Stout. God oh, bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dick. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Sunday Thank service you. will be a live stream service again. We'll keep talking about that as we go along, but Sunday service will be a live stream service, uh, not in person again. So just to pass the word along. Amen. 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 Thank you. Oh. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a blessed That's evening. Right. You too, Good night, night Kathleen. Right. Hi, right. Mom. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Have a blessed one on purpose. Yeah. All Good right. night. Kathleen, you look like you're on vacation. Who? <laughs> Kathleen, she looks like she's on yeah, vacation. She look is. Good. She <laughs> is. Uh, All relax. Friends. <laughs> what you say, Tika Stout? She said, I said, Kathleen's in the South of France. <laughs> no, she just ordered a hamburger from Jacques in the box. Oh, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Thank Good night, Jeff. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yeah, he just is crazy. <laughs> Any crazy right this, this is just as bad as he is, so you ride along with it. That's what <laughs> That's why they call him Wild Bill. So. Yeah, that's right. And you ride along with him, they're gonna call you <laughs> with him. Amen. All yeah. right, we'll see you in the morning with Dr. J. Well, Dr. J with me that's tomorrow morning, I guess. But. your calendar is on your desk. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that, Kathleen. I put it on here today, so it's on there. All right, great. Thank you very much. All right. All right, see you tomorrow. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.